Let's play with some gods. Can you all hear me okay? Gods, yes. Let's play, uh, let's play with some gods. Um, at the end of his life in 1955, despite his formidable achievements, um, Albert Einstein knew that he had failed to prove the holy grail of physics. That all things from the invisibly minute to the awesomely grand are one force. A theory of God, if you will. Einstein wrote that, quote, veneration for this force beyond anything that we can comprehend is my religion. The finest emotion of which we are capable is the mystic emotion. Herein lies the germ of all art and all true science. Anyone to whom this feeling is alien, who is no longer capable of wonderment and lives in a state of fear is a dead man. In this sense and in this sense alone, I rank myself among profoundly religious men. Referred to, the, to this as the unified field Einstein's unproved theory is audacious in its elegance, but yet may prove to be false. It would be equally fascinating to me if that were so. If Einstein is right, and everything is an elegant totality, then artists like Piero della Francesca, uh, the Quattrocento artist who died blind in 1492, and who wrote what is now considered to be the three most important books on on uh, geometry uh, from the Renaissance and perspective. And I can tell you that I've read the books and I went to see his drawings, which are typically about this big, uh, uh, up in Parma. I'm indebted, um, though, to the painter Roger Tibbets for sharing me with, with me his discoveries about Piero's flagellation, discoveries that I've confirmed through my own research. Let me show you what I mean, and let's hit the lights. Uh, there's so much that we can talk about regarding this painting. Uh, and one of the primary ideas, I'm gonna show you some things, I'm gonna show you a few things that have never been written about regarding this painting. Uh, it has been referred to as uh, the most important painting in the world. The, the most important small painting in the world. I disagree. It's the most important small painting in the West. Uh, and as you can see, uh, Piero is following a, uh, a, a dictum which is consistent with Renaissance thinking. That is that the, uh, the compass creating the circle and the squares, uh, as you can see marked out in the image on the left, uh, is, is something that actually can be broken down into myriad elements. But the most important thing regarding this is that Piero is a master of something that we've not discussed yet this morning. And that is that um, space and flat are really the answer. That the tension between flat and space are an extremely powerful force. And we see that in the compression of the figures that you see on the left in the actual painting. On the right is the visible plan of the entire space. And it's very, very difficult to comprehend that because the shapes of space, and I prefer to use that phrase instead of negative space because the fact is that space is always moving. And space is always not only negative, but as uh, to suggest that it's behind us or beside us, but that it's actually moving forward as well. And it's constantly in a state of flux. The space shapes in the, uh, in the Piero are so narrow, as you can see between the, uh, let's see if I can get up and show you what I mean. In this space here, if you take and count the spaces as they move back. They actually make this that takes you all the way back to the end of the wall. 
Uh, I think it's easier, and, and, and frankly, so you can see the plotting of, the, uh, of, of, of how everything ends up. This, this is a square, which lines up with the edge of this space. This space is exactly the same as this space. And this is a way for Piero to combine two experiences in time that whole scholars have been writing about regarding these three figures in the foreground. Nobody really knows who they are. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, but as you can see, uh, here's the vanishing point. And, and you can see how that line takes us down to the edge of the uh, painting. It originally, as all Renaissance paintings like this were made, it originally had a frame that was built prior to the execution of the painting. Let's go to the next two slides. So now we've cleared away all, the, uh, all this stuff. And another way that Piero develops his sense of space and flat is that he is a master of tangencies. And those tangencies actually operate spatially. So that, for example, the eye of this figure on the right is lining up with those elements, architectural elements back here. That the eye of the figure here uh, is lining up, the left eye is lining up with the arch uh, that goes behind the mazocchio, which is a uh, Renaissance hat. It's a framed male's hat with cloth stretched over it. And then uh, we start to see an, another remarkable thing. Uh, uh, Pontius Pilate is depicted uh, with uh, a staircase. Some of the nose is missing, so it's a little bit misleading. But in fact, you can see that tangency is actually flattening the space in a remarkable way. So this tension is everything to our understanding of this. This is one of my myriad drawings that I made on site of the, uh, of, uh, of the Piero. Now what I'm about to show you uh, is, 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 is quite remarkable. Uh, first of all, if you look at the turban of this figure who's watching this event, which is way back in space, this is very atypical of Renaissance art. In fact, we know of only one example from Pisa that exists prior to the making of this painting. And um, you can see that that turban uh, was carefully worked out in preliminary drawings. I've seen the drawing. And the drawing has, for those of you who don't know what pouncing is, he took that little drawing, which is about this big, and he had, he put, um, with a tool, he went around all the lines of the turban, and the tool had little spokes on it, right? And do you know about pouncing? And, and so with this tool, it puts little holes in it. He flips the cartoon over. Cartoon comes from the Italian cartone, which literally means cardboard, okay? And he flips it over, and he pounces with charcoal dust and a sock right through that. And so in the painting itself, you can actually see the little dots that showed how he could construct that turban alone. This is how precise he is about, and I talk about this a lot but in, in my own work, but the big, the vast, and the little, the microscopic, are elements that Piero was very aware of. And so the attention that he gives to this has a way of taking us and look at the space shape that he creates with that turban and um, the, the, um, the staircase space that goes behind it. <coughs> um, here's an amazing thing. Watch this, this will knock you out. Um, so this figure is standing and looking at Christ being flagellated and his location is mathematically exactly the same location as the viewer is to these figures. Cool, huh? 
If the hairs aren't standing on the back of your neck, that, that should do it. But I've got something even better. And this, uh, I owe to, Dave, uh, to uh, Roger Tibbetts. I was always looking at these hands. And I was always trying to, you know, this is something that's typical of Piero. There's a, there's a, where everything is in balance and everything is in tension. But sometimes those elements appear to be strange. And they appear to be almost uh, uh, cryptographs of the larger scene. And this is true here as well. So what he does is he sets up this, these hands to do this. Now, if you take this, sorry, if you take this and you run your hand along that edge and you go up around the, the it's, 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 the implication is to uh, ancient Rome and it's a Neronian type figure. Um, when you come up around and you come around here and you flip that down, it fits exactly in this space here. These are the things that I think about and that artists over the centuries have thought about, and in our own time, artists like Giorgio Morandi. So let's go on to the next two slides. And here's where um, it's gonna, we, it, it's, it's a little hard to see. I'm gonna be um, talking a little bit about my own work. This has 67 sheets of paper because I work on site and the pieces of paper are taped together and I work on them over years and I work with woodcuts and, and uh, intaglio prints and, and uh, the dirt from the catacombs and uh, the tufa that um, creates this, uh, this fantastic mud that I used as an ink uh, to make these colors that you see here. And the spaces that I use this is the Cervello, I'm sorry, the brain. <laughs> I'm still in Italy, I guess. Uh, the Cervello, the or the brain, and um, it starts to repeat itself throughout the painting. And so there's certain key elements in this that have a relationship to this, and there are key elements in this that have a relationship to this. So um, let's go on. So in 1990, uh, powerful recurrent dreams <clears throat> led me to work underground. I've made many friends over time who have supported my life's obsession, and it really is an obsession. Including the priests and archeologists who are the custodians of this spiritual little known world my language has a long way to go. I'm so far away from where I want to be. But I am backed by my historical teachers uh, from the likes of Piero and his geometry, uh, Dante's and Borges' worlds within worlds, uh, Messian's, uh, this is for Frank if he's here, Messian's and Gubaidulina's, microtonal musical colors, and the richness of ancient Asian painting. Unseen forces in the catacombs merge time, silence, and memory into one force, uniting the invisible and visible, where the seen pays a constant debt to the unseen. We can keep going. Neurologists question the plausibility of synesthesia. But the novelist Vladimir Nabokov and his wife Vera saw specific colors in the wordplay and numerical puzzles Vladimir embedded in his fiction. But this is the interesting part. Dmitri, their son, shared the trait of synesthesia. The colors he associated with some letters were blends of his parents' hues. Really like that. Um, as it is with synesthesia, when we draw, new channels open up between our eyes and our breathing, 
heart rate, and neurological pads. Borders dissolve between touch, smell, and sound. Because I work on my drawings over years, people ask me how I know when they're finished, and the answer is, when they smell right. <laughs> I piece small sheets of paper so I can work in the narrowest, hard-to-reach tunnels of the catacombs. My paper stays damp due to the high humidity below ground and disintegrates in the best sense under repeated erasing and sanding as I search. I draw with simple materials, uh, watercolors, conti crayons, charcoal, and inks, and as I mentioned, even the volcanic tufa soil underfoot. As it is with the evolution of life in the world's deepest oceans, animals have made similar adaptations to the absolute darkness underground. Now we'll slow down a little. Uh, uh, long, worm-like creatures with millipede-like <coughs> legs coexist with 10-inch phosphorescent mantises. Blind, translucent spiders use um, uh, the size of my hand uh, make clicking sounds with their legs on the walls of the silent tunnels. Thousands of zingy green aphids skitter up stalactites in a silence so complete that I hear my heartbeat. Dank, cold humidity preserves nearly 2,000 years old skeletons in their tombs, but if disturbed, they would turn to dust. Paintings and carvings form mysterious iconographic hybrids of an emerging spiritual language. I believe in taking the long way around, working slow, slowly, joyfully, on site, and doing everything possible in the studio to prolong the process. For example, I build three-dimensional models where animal bones and old tools substitute for on-site trees and stumps, where stacks of abandoned mud wasp houses peppered it with, when we can keep going, with oblong tunnels become archeological labyrinths in miniature. And uh, it's almost impossible, I can't even see these. <laughs> uh, uh, these are dreams. Uh, which uh, I uh, sometimes roll up and put into my paintings. And you can see that the spiders are very large. <laughs> OK. Let's go on. Let's keep going. I beat the living crap out of my drums, um, to use another professional phrase. Uh, uh, I show you this because in the center, I'm often thinking about the periphery. And uh, I have to tell you that uh, when I was a student at the Cleveland Institute of Art, I was a transfer student. And um, I was really good at sneaking into concerts. Uh, with my top hat and hair down to here, and um, with my girlfriend who became my wife 40 years ago. And um, uh, I would spend my lunches in the Asian section of the, uh, of the Cleveland Museum of Art, which is still free. And I would eat my lunch down there because I got to know the guards and they, you know, you're not supposed to eat. Right. But anyway, so I'm eating my lunches, and along comes this very elderly man, and he says, you know, I see you down here all the time. And, um, and he said, you know, and we started talking, and he said, well, I'm Sherman Lee. I used to be the director of the museum. How would you like to see some things in the, uh, in the, uh, in the vaults? 
And I, uh, Asian art has always been an extremely important influence on my thinking, particularly the way that uh, flat and space work and how space breathes. And um, you're seeing some examples of my work. This is a painting called Chiron, and it's, um, you know, it's fairly big. So, to show you a couple of these, um, uh, Hasegawa Tohaku, who dies in 1610, the same year as Caravaggio in the West, uh, uh, is deeply influenced by Seshu, who dies in 1504 in Japan, and is deeply influenced by uh, uh, the work of Muchi. And Muchi is working in China uh, in the mid 13th century. And uh, uh, we see the end of the Southern Song Dynasty in 1279. Uh, he's probably working in the mid 13th, uh, 13th, uh, 13th century. And as we look at this, you can see all the ideas that Piero is using, but with some new ones. Uh, the, the mother monkey and her, and it's, it's the right hand panel of the triptych. Uh, the mother monkey is on this beautiful branch. Uh, we know what the focus of the image is, but you start to see echoing throughout the entire piece where this dramatic branch has a direct relationship to the angle of the, uh, of the mother. Uh, we can see that the weights of the inks are used in such a way that they are not what we would observe, but instead um, make a space that is very believable. And it's like sound. That space has that kind of sound. And it makes, um, and, and we see that throughout. But I think the most interesting part of this piece is the void and the relationship of the void to the animals. And uh, we can see that in Tohaku as well. Um, the changes in weight, uh, the emphasis on uh, the particularity of every mark, where every mark has its unique quality. And then take your hand, do that if you would, you guys, take your hand and remove the roots and you can see how important the specificity of the roots are to the construction of the whole. You start to see relationships between those rhythms and what's occurring across the surface. Notice the open space here. Now again, we're always talking about space as negative, but in fact, the space is breathing and, and moving forward and back, and the weights enhance that. Space is episodic. Remember that it has, that they're created through a series of overlapping episodes, but not always. <clears throat> and space has, uh, in effect, become my visual obsession as I work. And once again, you can see that move, that motion and the speed of that motion as you contemplate it, as it moves throughout the entire piece. Okay, let's go to the next. Uh, in 1951, uh, the little-known Henri Cartier-Bresson took this photograph of Matisse four years before he died in 1954. And this is a photograph of Matisse in his apartment with, at the time of his death, we find uh, over 350 birds. Imagine the bird shit. I mean, it's, uh, it's incredible. But uh, the cleanup must have been extraordinary. But when we, when we look at Matisse, what's he doing? He's actually holding the dove. And, and he's holding it. And you can imagine how, as the bird comes, as he takes the bird, the heart rate is moving fast. And as his hand warms and the bird starts to calm down, the heart rate changes. The interior aspects of what's occurring with the bird are as essential to the drawing that Matisse is making 
late in life, remember that he's drawing from not only observation, but from touch and from a sensibility of understanding the interior world. This is what's so special about the teas, I believe. And so when we look at this drawing uh, of this remarkable violinist, Eva Mudochi. Eva Mudochi was a British violinist who changed her name to an Italianate name so that she would get more gigs in Europe. I, I still find that really funny. And she was Edvard Munch's muse. And when you see photographs of her, she was extraordinarily beautiful. And uh, we now have recent historical data to suggest that Munch had um, twins uh, with Eva Budoji. But at any rate, when Matisse gets his hands on her, you can see that there's the original portrait. <clears throat> and, and, and as was mentioned earlier this morning, African art and Iberian art becomes um, uh, uh, crucial to the artist uh, at this time. And he's looking for ways to edit and simplify. And he's not using pretty marks. These are, this is a Conti crayon drawing. The drawing is exactly this big because I have every intention of stealing it. And, um, and, and as you can see, he adds paper in order to make the proportions exact. Now, this is very important in understanding Matisse. Uh, I made the huge mistake uh, of going with um, um, 97 students uh, to the Soviet Union uh, in my first trip abroad with a bunch of faculty and, and uh, wonderful faculty, a great Russian scholar, for example, and, uh, and parents, but 97 students, which was really amazing. And uh, we're all crowded into this room and we're looking at the painting music. And I said to the students, and there were approximately this many people in the room, I said to the students. Matisse's wife, who was a milliner, uh, was very helpful because Matisse was unhappy with what that painting, the proportions of the edges of the, of the canvas. And he felt that it needed this much more. So his wife sewed on the back an extra strip of that great linen that he was using, French linen. And in the back, as I'm describing this phenomena, there's this voice with a thick Russian accent. A woman said, is that true? And I thought, oh God, I hope so. <laughs> and at any rate, she said, I'm the director of the Hermitage and let's find out. So they took all the paintings in that room and turned them around. And there, thank God, was this strip of canvas that shows that Matisse was that sensitive. So he had new stretcher bars built and uh, went on with that masterpiece, which was originally for Staircase, a platonic hierarchy in Shushikin's apartment in Moscow. Thomas, let me ask the question, how large was that painting? Uh, the painting is uh, exactly the same size as the preliminary study at the Museum of Modern Art. How many feet? I don't remember. And it's large. Yeah, oh, it's so big. It, it's really, really big. It was big. very small. I mean, yeah, yeah, this, 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 the difference between this, get this, artists, the difference between this and this can mean the difference between good and great. And I'm not kidding. This is a really important idea. And all of these artists are sensitive to this. And it goes back to Piero. And it goes back even farther. You think of Giotto as well, and you think of Masaccio and Masolino and all of these artists that, uh, and the Sienese. But look at this. Take your hand. Everybody got to play along. Take your hand and remove the bottom of the of the drawing, and you can see why he added that extra section. And not only that, but he stops in certain places on the edge, so he's actually using the paper itself. The paper is never uh, there, kind of lying back in supine position, saying, do it to me, baby. <laughs> Instead, he's, he's, he's setting up this, uh, uh, this, this uh, conversation between the paper and uh, the sheets 
and, uh, and then he uses a little tiny strip to retain the tension of the rectangle. So you can see, look at the myriad erasing. Now, uh, we call this pentimenti uh, or pentimento, but this is tons of pentimenti. Pentimenti comes from the Italian word, which means repentance. Okay, so he's constantly repenting of the ideas that, on which he's working. And he doesn't, he doesn't change paper. He's actually working on the same paper, and the legacy of the erasure is incredibly important to the magnetic field that occurs in the drawing. Okay, let's go on to the next two. <laughs> on the right, I always say Michelangelo is the easiest artist to draw, to, to study, and I rarely draw. I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I happen to think that Michelangelo uh, and Leonardo are the two greatest drawers of the West. Um, uh, Michelangelo has a slightly heavier hand, um, and, uh, like, and you know, people, I, scholars like to call it a sculptor's hand. I think that's nonsense, but anyway. Um, but uh, this is my study of one of the cartoons, Cartoni, for um, uh, the Pauline Chapel paintings, which are little known, but they were very famous at the time in the Pope's private chapel. On the left is Michelangelo. And here what we see is, and remember that they didn't have erasers back then, they used bread. And if you've ever used Italian bread, and I have my students do this, you dampen the bread. Okay, it's gotta be Italian bread. Okay? <laughs> um, and you dampen the bread and you make uh, something that's very akin to uh, kneaded erasers. And you can see that in this late, possibly a presentation drawing for um, Tommaso uh, de Cavalieri, who was 23 years old when Michelangelo fell in love with him. Whether it was platonic love or uh, the other kind, who knows? But, uh, and who cares? But uh, the fact of the matter is that in, 15, uh, in 1532, uh, Michelangelo makes this, and they're, the late drawings, some of those late drawings are actually drawings that were made as presentation drawings. And I would argue that this is one, in other words, a finished piece. When you look up above, I love the straight edges that he's using. When you look up above, you can see that he's made the arms asymmetrical. And you can see the erasure marks up above, just like Matisse. Then when you look at the head, it's amazing because it's cinematic. The head is actually moving in agony. You can actually see that agony going on. And then down below is the Virgin, and typically it would be St. John, but in this case it's probably Nicodemus. And um, because he's older. And um, what is amazing about this is that what, would, what you don't draw or what you remove, the process of excavation, this is thoughtful removal. This is not removal for the sake of removal. This kind of thoughtful removal suggests a relationship of space and apparition-like quality that gives this, I always say that Michelangelo would be known as a minor poet if he'd never touched a drawing or a piece of marble. <coughs> And, um, and, he, and I think that this creates an incredible poetry that sets up a charge between the asymmetry of the drawing. This is what's so exciting. Imagine that if he'd filled this in. Now, he was working from left to right, so it's possible that he might have gone on and continued to finish this, but it's unlikely if it was a presentation drawing, and I tend to think it was. It's his time that he was doing this. And so uh, we see this, ignore the ink drawing up there because that was done later as a signature by uh, an owner. Okay. Uh, this drawing is exactly this big and I have uh, stolen that. Okay, let's go on to the, uh, probably my favorite Michelangelo drawing, let's go on. So, uh, uh, I built a library, I have three kinds of sketchbooks. Uh, and I think a lot of us do. Um, the first are hardbound sketchbooks that I have made for me in a CC, which is very cool. 
and um, uh, I bring my paper because I they don't have the paper I want, and I'll tell you what the paper is if you want to know. But anyway, it's fantastic to draw, and I bring my paper, and they make these hardbound books for me. I use a children's encyclopedia, fake leather, and it's exactly like this. This is the size, and this is a children's um, encyclopedia. And did you eat cookies? <laughs> Great. Okay. And um, this is my newest sketchbook. And um, anyway, uh, three kinds. So I go into museums and churches and um, on site and, uh, and all kinds of places. And I record and I change the drawings. I rarely am doing a drawing like you saw in the Michelangelo. Secondly, uh, I, uh, I, I like what I read better than what I'm about to say. Um, I, 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 in those kind of books, I soaked my clothes with sweat on top of the Parthenon. I got special permission to climb those. They didn't have railings, and it was in the middle of winter, and it was really windy. And I'm climbing up to the top of the Parthenon, and I soaked my clothes. And the lead archaeologist on the site, that controversial Parthenon uh, restoration, he said, are you OK? And I'm thinking, yeah, what am I going to say? I said, yes, of course I'm OK. I was terrified. And, um, and at the top, one can see the emphasis of the entire building. It's not merely uh, uh, the, the simpler geom geometric things that people talk about. One can actually see it. You can also see chicken bones from 5th century BC workers up there that snuck their chicken bones in under the capitals. And you can also see color. And um, uh, uh, so my second kind of sketchbook is where I draw on envelopes, paper scraps, and on minutes but from boring faculty meetings. <laughs> and uh, perhaps most importantly, I have my library of unconscious states. You can just run. Um, I have my library of unconscious states. For the past 40 years, I've documented my dreams in sketchbooks with narratives and drawings. Often these dreams have proven to be prophetic, harbingers of where I need to go next. And this is one of the strangest things uh, about my dream life is that I have these dreams that are exactly where when I go into a space, it's laid out exactly as in the dream. Uh, the studio is the perfect place for these kind of things and my models to um, enter my dreams and enter my work. Um, I do, I, I'm showing you some doubles in my sketchbook. Every mark with the watercolor, I close the book. I use the book as a way to go like that. And that's a Conte crayon drawing. Let's go through these. <laughs> and you can see how they enter and change in the actual paintings. Let's keep going. This is one of my etchings. And, um, and uh, you can see the original drawing. And then you can see it in reverse. Um, it always bothered me that I couldn't um, visualize these things in reverse, but neither could Edvard Munch. Um, he, he, uh, his, his, his prints are always the reverse of his paintings. Uh, this, um, this is a strange image because in Naples, in this particular catacomb, men and women were kept separately. But the woman in this particular case was afraid of another man. So she was allowed to stay with her husband. And the heads would be placed, they would paint with fresco, and then the heads would be placed into the uh, holes that you see. And so this painting, you can barely see them, but I included um, them over here, but I changed them a lot. Uh, this is Chiron again, and you can see where I was using an antifisa from an Etruscan uh, tomb that I was uh, slip sliding down in my days before I got MS. And you can see how I use it in the painting uh, with uh, these fake eyes that I've been collecting. I have hundreds of them. And uh, this is uh, one of my models. Um, I mentioned my models. And 
Uh, this is, uh, a, you know, a three-quarter view, and this is the back of the bottle. I think I like the back best. And uh, uh, so, um, as we go through these, and I don't know if you can, you see why I told you to come up close. It's hard to see them. Um, let's go on. Let's go on. Yeah. Keep going. Okay, we stop there. I close with two thoughts. In her novel, The Abyss, Marguerite Yersenar is a god. Excellent god. Marguerite, write this down. Yersenar. The rule with my students is you always write down the name of somebody you've never heard of. Okay. Marguerite Yersenar quotes an alchemical dictum, obscurum per obscurius, ignotum per ignotius, which roughly translates, proceed toward the obscure and unknown, through the still more obscure and unknown. <laughs> and here's a little poem that I wrote. Walk the Plank is the title. This is your dream. You're on a ship at sea and find yourself condemned to death. The ship's captain commands you to walk the plank. This is your artist's dream. The plank is safe, the sea certain death. <coughs> you jump, knowing that all great art occurs in the space between the plank and the sea. Thank you very much. Thank you.